You got a diamond. You got nine men. You got a hat, a bat, and that's not all. You got the bleachers. You got them from spring till fall. You got a dog, a drink, an umpire's call. What do you want? Let's play ball. Da, 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 Okay. Okay. Blue Jays, Blue Jays. Let's play ball. Oh, Brian, man, that's great. Nobody's done that. <laughs> The Jays start up this week. I'm fired up for it. So that's, I figured that's great. give him a shout out. <laughs> well, the show will be on soon enough, so everyone will be probably tuning in and singing along and getting ready for the. Yeah, we're all seeing the snow melt, which is great to see. Springtime is the best time of year. Leafs haven't lost yet. The Jays are just about to start. It's good. <laughs> it's all optimism. Yeah, exactly. That's all it is. Welcome to the show, Brian. I really appreciate you being on the show. Thanks for having me. This is exciting. We're going to have an interesting conversation. This is something I wanted to chat for for like the longest time. Ever since I've known about it, I wanted to chat about it. Uh, not a lot of people know about this. Yeah, we're relatively new in, the, it, it, in construction that in general, there's not a lot of completely new things that come along and, and we feel like we're in that space. So we launched about five years ago. I think that's when we first maybe started chatting and, and getting to know each other. And we've been growing and on a pretty cool journey and excited to talk about it a little bit. I was just on the way here. I was actually just talking about that. This should be something that's included in the building code because there's a lot of stuff that's in the building code that I disagree with. But this is something I know the reasons why it's not in the building code, but we'll get into all of that. So I just want to share out your deeds. First of all, Brian Cook is here. Arrow Barrier Canada, Inc. Uh, you're the GM. Five years. Website is airsealingpros.ca. Uh, to reach out to you is brian.cook with an E at arrowseal.com. And on Instagram, it's Arrow Barrier Canada. Uh, let me do a quick shout out. I got to do a uh, tie. I'm wearing his long sleeve tee. Probably the last time you'll see me in a long sleeve because it's getting warm. So Ty from Nickel General. Thank you so much, bro. Uh, always love seeing your work on online and checking out what you're up to. All kinds of great projects. And then also we recently did a show that uh, we've been getting a lot of electricians on the show lately. And uh, I like that. Their electricians are not like the uh, the framers. Uh, framers are very shy and skittish, uh, but electricians and drywallers are, they love being on the mic. They love being on camera, which is great. But Pato actually reached out to me and he wanted to just clarify something that was brought up. Uh, you know that it's code now that every smoke alarm has to be a smoke and carbon monoxide and also has a strobe light on it for hearing impaired individuals, right? A lot of people disagree with the strobe light. And he just wanted to make sure that he wants everybody to understand that the strobe light has got nothing to do with the ESA Electrical Safety Authority. It's got everything to do with the OBC, which is the Ontario Building Code. So they're just being forced and it's being left on the doorstep of the electricians that they have to install this $150 smoke sensor strobe unit when we were so used to buying units that were 50 bucks that were smoke and, and CO censored, right? So he just wanted to clarify that. And I was like, that's actually a good point that you brought that up because we didn't bring it up. So it's OBC's fault, not ESA's fault. I got other things to talk about when it comes to ESA's fault, right? But all right. So Brian, where do we want to begin this conversation? Because I know that I was joking about that this should be with OBC. But my concern is that it's going to um, make builders have to build better. <laughs> yeah, it's a good place to start, and it it, it, it is a funny one because you know, you know primary what we're, we're we're dealing with is air, air tightness, and it's been something that has been on the cutting room floor on on code changes for going back ten to fifteen years, and it's but, in the but let me say this: the crop of new generation contractors out there, they're educating themselves about this. It, yeah, they want to actually do it. Yeah, it, and that's kind of funny. Like that's been our, our sweet spot early on with client base of, of kind of that second generation build. There's a lot of times yep. these companies are passed down, and we're, we're getting some nice traction. So I, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. And uh, yeah, so it's been on the building. It's you know it's been on the discussion table for a long time of, of coming into code, and this is uh, enforcing air tightness testing. It air tightness is already in the code. You know we have verbiage around we need to install air barriers, and they need to be continuous. And it goes as far as even highlighting what we expect homes to be from an air tightness perspective. It will actually put a metric in there that we assume all houses are this airtight. So, and it can get a little a little dicey as we've been in Terry on claims where lawyers get on that verbiage of what does continuous mean? Should there be a metric around that? And so, yeah, you like what what means to something to us in the industry versus again a lawyer can be quite interesting. So we 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 have, when we talk to builders and and people building homes from a liability standpoint. Almost don't want to be afraid of that test because you want to be able to say, hey, yeah, 
This is what I was told to do. Yeah, exactly. This is what I was told to do, and this is what I was able to do. And oh, by the way, I beat that. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, but a blower door test is not has nothing to do with either building R2000 or building Energy Star or building any of that. It's got it's not it's not a prerequisite. We don't have to do it. No. Yeah. So R2000, like some of those programs would have a requirement for a, a certain score in that, but you can do a blower door test on any bill, then get a feel for where you are, and uh, it, it's a it's a cool thing, you know. I would say one of my favorite things about this industry is there is that sense of pride you're, yeah. of what you're working on. And so when, when builders get a, and something to be, you will actually hand over, you know, not a lot of trades can say, Hey, I did good work. What does that mean? Where air tightness is, is a really nice proxy. You can actually get a score. Of, hey, here's what an average house is. Here's what the building code says it should be. And I blew that out of the water and got to one and a half air changes or, or under one. So yeah, there's nothing prescriptive in the code here in Ontario yet. Um, but there's lots of opportunities and programs that will give you credit for, for going above and beyond and, and, and something nice to talk to your, your clients about is uh, what makes you different as a, as a builder or as an insulator or any contractor that has that as part of their scope of work. I mean, the nice thing here is, and it's always been a challenge for any tradesperson or contractor that wants to get into the, that, that realm of being a builder, it's, it's an uphill battle with the clients to try to sell something that they don't see, but they will feel. Right. And I remember I had such a proud moment when I built my first house that we got to 0.07. Nice. And that was because of so many headaches that I was being told that my first thought was, I want to hire, hire a, a, a building consultant. I want someone that I can meet that I met through my network because I was going through certain events that a lot of builders in the industry probably would find boring. But I was going to talk to, for lack of a better word, tree huggers. Right. But there were people that were conscious of how to do certain things. And it was really about, and, and this has been educated to me several times, it's about the building system. So I took a lot of pride in that first house where I was conscious about possible air leakage. And it was always the protrusions. It was always the overhangs. It was always some sort of structural member that was protruding past the envelope of the house. That's where you were getting these holes in the house. And then you started talking about, yeah, it's a little hole here. It's a little hole there. Who cares? Yeah. But by the time you add up all these holes, it's the size of a basketball now. So then we started, and then you start learning about HRVs, ERVs and all this other stuff. So when we did our, our and we did it during the different stages. So you, you went through, you know, pre drywall, you went through all kinds of stuff like that. And to get that 0.07, that was huge. So they were very impressed for like first time builders and you did all this extra work and you were cocking this and sealing that. And this is the reason why. Now you try to sell that to the client. It's energy consumption at that point. So like I'm big on, I'm sorry, but gas appliances. I'm huge on gas appliances. I get that Quebec and other parts of the country is probably bigger on electrical appliances, but you save more money and you leave a lesser footprint, environmentally speaking, when you're using natural gas, right? So if you start building a certain way, you'll start saving this money, but this is hard for your clients to wrap their head around when all they focus on are designer magazines, designer shows, designer this, designer that, and they want all these bells and whistles. They don't care about what's on the other side of the drywall. How do we have that conversation, Brian? With yeah, them? yeah, it's a really good question and it, uh, a common one. And and uh, yeah, it, I, I think it's an interesting concept because I feel like homeowners come into it and almost just assume that every house is perfect. <laughs> so and then it's like then I'll put the nice finishes on the inside. And the reality <laughs> if it of, looks perfect, <laughs> they think it's perfect. And yeah, the reality of that is 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 far way off, right? And we we see unfortunately on some of the highest end homes like that assumption of that. Uh, Things like air tightness, but more and maybe even more importantly, water intrusion and all those details that are actually are this house going to survive and, and act and function the way I'm supposed to uh, it's supposed to be. Yeah, it's all taken for granted. And, and then it's like, OK, what am I spending past that? And that's that's not the reality of home building and, and quite frankly, not even close. So I, I think we like to try to start to the conversation back to, hey, you know, how long do you expect the house to last? And and air tightness is, is a big piece of that. Why it's in the building code as as an air barrier is. You know, we want to control moisture first and foremost. So building a strong air barrier and not having moisture, warm, moist air from inside traveling through your walls is, is, is going to help that wall not rot out and, and have mold problems. So, okay, now oh, I use the word mold. Oh, that might get in their attention a little bit. <laughs> Indoor air quality. Do you, where, what do you want your kids breathing? And, and, and then, oh, by the way, comfort. You know, we all want that radiant heat and, and that nice big open spaces. But if you have a, everyone's had that experience of living in a drafty home or, an older home and you sit by the window and it's never comfortable or you got that room on the third floor that no matter how hard you run the AC, uh, 
you're never you're boiling in the summer. You're, you're bringing up a bunch of great points <laughs> that I want to actually discuss and tackle because you, right now I'm so conscious because of these days you've got technology like Ecobee and you got sensors, and I could dictate exactly what room, what floor, what area within a degree. I can design my own house to figure out that the whole house is evenly tempered all around, right? And then that's important to me. It's it's kind of I go back to being proud of that. So, but I mean, homeowners don't really pay attention to that, but it's just like, I, I keep on trying to have this discussion with them about energy consumption. I like, I like having conversations with certain people that live in condos and they have their maintenance fees. And, and first of all, I, I'll blast condos all the time because they're the worst culprits when it comes to leakage. They're designed a certain way with balconies, with certain elements that automatically make holes in the structure. And so you, you can't, you can't seal them properly, but in a home you can, there's gotta be a way to do it. So I try to explain to them, I go, here's my energy consumption for gas and hydro and water this month. And they're like, what are you talking about? I go, that's this month. How is that so low? Because of certain things that I'm doing. I may not be doing the whole house at one time, but I'm doing sections of it. And if you're conscious of it, eventually every structure has six sides, no matter how you look at it, it has six sides. If you start working on each side, Eventually, you get to the point where the whole structure is going to be sealed properly. That's what we want to educate these people like. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you touched on some words there. It's really that the house as a system is kind of like the, the elite thought process. And where you want to try to get to is as you change one thing in your house and as, you know, building code maybe even pushes us in one direction to build more energy efficient. We have to think about all the, the counter effects to that and uh, how do those pieces come together. What are the things I like to talk about in your, in your question of how do we talk to homeowners and educate them? One of the cool parts about building a house that is performs as well as possible, is most comfortable, lasts the longest, are all the same things that we do to save energy for the most part. Uh, we want to build them airtight, we want to insulate well, and then have the right amount of ventilation. So those things, you don't have to sacrifice performance. You know, you know, it's not like you're buying a Hummer, but you're not. it's not being energy efficiency. Yeah. It, when you're building a house, the things that you do to make it as comfortable as possible are all the same things you do to make it energy efficient. And, and so using that verbiage, it has worked with us a little bit with homeowners, but for the most part, our, our, I'll be quite frank, our success has been tapping into the builders who just have that pride or trades. And like, you want to build better anyway. You know that the client will want this, whether or no they want it up front. And, and hopefully we can find a way to like work that into their budget as a, a, and save some some dollars and cents elsewhere to kind of kind of. I know this is an open ended question because the thing is, I know that there's more and more. And I go back to the younger trades, the younger GCs, the ones that actually want to establish themselves slightly different than what the market is. And there's certain builders out there that are trying to go greener, for lack of a better word, right? Where they're building a certain way. And I know that when you build new or you renovate new or you renovate a section of a house, the numbers are pretty similar. I don't care who you argue with, the numbers are pretty similar. So if you build it and spend that extra time and effort just putting a membrane, sealing this, or using a specific product, the problem is that you get a lot of companies that come in and try to convince you to only use all of their products on the entire structure. And I've been a huge advocate about saying, that's BS, I'm sorry to say, but that is BS. I don't, like, if you drive a specific brand vehicle, I don't necessarily have to have all of their products in that vehicle to make it perform the best possible way. There's a reason why there's aftermarket products, because there's other products that are other companies that have come up with better products that make your home better. So I want clients to understand that you don't have to go. That's where it starts to get very, very expensive because now they kind of loop you in. And we don't, it's not about that. It's okay. So if you need to, s terminations are a big one. Terminations are all holes in a house. That's all, like, no matter how you look at it, there's no single structure that doesn't have a termination, doesn't have a hole. We have windows, we have doors, we have mechanical terminations, we have air, all kinds of stuff like that. It's how you adopt it, how you seal it, right? So you guys, I mean, I want to get into eventually how you guys perform your, your tasks and, and then the data that's attached to it, right? But I, I still am on that whole page about the clients and somehow the GC now has to convince the client, but it's not really expensive to put it in your wheelhouse, to put it as part of your toolbox. You correct me if I'm wrong, right? No, I think that that's really well said. And, and yeah, we, you know, it, uh, what, I think maybe we're holding on to t times and cast like 30 years ago, we built our first R2000 house and someone came up with a, oh, it cost me an extra 50 grand. No, we have, we have builders that we're working with that are building full or net zero ready homes, uh, you know, one of the higher standards and they're, they're doing it for a couple thousand bucks yeah. more. Like it, it and you, it takes practice and an understanding of what you're doing and why and, 
And to your point, it, it, the right products for where you're building and the type of houses you're building. But it's really more of an attention to detail. It's only really costing you a know, mindset, not really hard dollars. And, and now all of a sudden, if you can put that in front of a client versus the person next to them uh, that maybe has a similar bid, you got a, a really cool value proposition to talk to about the quality of your work, um, you know, holistically, not just energy, but and some of the other things we talked about. It'll actually separate you as a builder too, because it'll already take you out of the underground economy kind of mindset, right? I, and I, I, it's been very few times I've had conversations with clients about, you're comparing me to somebody who's going to do it for cash, who's not carrying a legitimate business, who wants to cut all these corners. There's no reason for me to have this conversation with you because you should be comparing me to somebody else that's going to be building the exact same standard. If they're going to build that same way, then guess what? The apples are going to look very similar on both estimates. That's just a fact, right? So if you want to go down this road, but a lot of clients want to go down this road because they want to hug the trees. They want to show their friends that, listen, we get it. We spent this. We, we did all this other stuff and we want to be conscious of all our footprint and stuff like that. But they're, like you said, being told that it costs X amount, but that's not the truth of it. It doesn't cost as much as you think it costs. No, it certainly doesn't. And then if you want to take it a step further, you know, you add, you bake in and, and model. Okay, maybe I'm putting even if my number's low, and you can we can you might can debate on it. But let's say it's ten thousand dollars. But then you go, how long you you planning to live there? How much more is ten thousand dollars into your mortgage versus the cash flow savings on your heating bill for the next twenty years? Oh, and by the way, your house is going to perform better. And and again, we can walk homeowners through that math that you're you're saving money uh, based on your interest rates and, and mortgage. You can get down the rabbit hole, but you know, okay, I'm going to spend a little bit more up front, but I'm going to reap that benefit until I move out of that house and, and then hopefully pass it on to someone else or kids. So there, there's uh, the value prop, you know, has changed, especially, I don't know if anyone's opened their Enbridge bill recently. <laughs> uh, it, the value prop's changing faster and faster, and they've already posted what it's going to be next year and the year after that. And so the math becomes more compelling by the day on dollar cents and loan. And then, yeah, you know, I think uh, you know, in general, people are becoming more aware of, climate change. And so, you know, there's a cost to society there as well that we can bake into our thought process. I think one of the good things, and I don't like bringing up the word, but in what happened in 21 and 22, 2021 and 2022, was it made people conscious that their home wasn't a home. It made them aware that their home wasn't livable. It wasn't comfortable. They started real, and I've done this several times where I'm fortunate enough to actually have a quiet house where I could sit there and I could hear the house. So like, I mean, I'm, I'm in the industry and I pay attention to structures and, and we all do this as builders. When you start building a structure at first and you get through the framing stage and you get through the insulation and mechanical, all the other stages, I've always done this. You walk around when it's dead as night, like the crews are gone, it's quiet. I don't go home yet. I'm standing there and I'm listening. I'm listening to the, what the house is doing because I'm paying attention to what's been built and I'm seeing if it's all being done properly because the house will tell you if it's actually being built properly. So in your own home, you can sit there and you can hear little noises. You can hear when the furnace is kicking in. You can hear the air movement. You can hear all kinds of little tweaks and it tells you what needs to be addressed and it tells you what has been successful. So I like doing all that kind of stuff. So I start paying attention to it. The, the thing is, I love that you brought up the, the clients and thinking about this whole what happened in 21 and 22. People started realizing that we don't want to put a for sale sign on the house anymore. No. We want to keep this house for 10 years, 20 years. We may even pass this house on to one of our children. So if you're already thinking that long-term way, then why don't you start addressing the home to be better in the long term? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's the cost up front, but there's the cost of maintenance and, and, and long term. And I think, yeah, I, I really again, I like the way you said that is I know my perspective changed, you know, going from you know, being out on the road and then spending time in your house, you start to know and feel like I don't like spending time in my basement. I So we, we worked on it. It's and fixed uncomfortable. Our yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's cold no matter what the furnace is doing. It's it's uncomfortable to be down there. So, you know, one of our COVID projects, I'm sure everyone has one was we started to renovate and work through our basement and had some cool lessons and, and learnings through that as well. And you just start learning little basic things that will help you. And all of a sudden you start realizing, I mean, I did the exact same thing recently too, where, you know, you demo everything, concrete's completely exposed. Then you start paying attention to the mechanical system. You're looking at what the house is telling you and you're like going, it's freezing down here. There's so many gaps in here. And then you start paying it. You start hearing it. You can actually hear air movement at that point. Then all of a sudden you come up with a plan of what you want to do. And again, you start doing your own R&D and you start paying attention to certain products that may or may not work, but you get the data attached to it. Then you install that product and all of a sudden you start paying attention to what the mechanical is doing and you're like going, 
wait a minute, this is actually benefiting. This is working. So it's kind of clever at that point, right? Yeah, it's absolutely. And it, it's cool how it just even, you know, you just feel like as you start to pull on one string, as you improve one piece, um, you start to, again, notice those things. Like I, we tested my small old wartime bunk load a couple times. We had it. It was very leaky when we moved in. We did some attic work, you know, five years ago, and it was noticeably better. And, and now we, we did some work in the basement. And again, it's noticeably more comfortable and you can, you can feel it on your energy bills, but more importantly, you can feel better about just that comfort of being able to use that space. We basically never had went down to our basement in, in my family in five years of being there. And now it's, <laughs> you know, we just had kids and, and so now it's our a little getaway for my wife and I, you know, we can actually sit down there and enjoy, you know, watching some TV because it's, it's livable all of a sudden. Were you surprised when you started analyzing it before the work and then after the work, were you surprised by the, the difference? Yeah, absolutely. Cause I, I'm naive to it. I'm still, I would still consider myself relatively new to the industry. So, you know, I, I around the same time I bought my house. So yeah, I started, we tested early on and leaky. And, and as I've learned more about the industry and how these pieces come together, it's like, you can kind of start to that visualize, oh, okay, that's what I learned and reading about. And then, but you can actually feel it. And still, you know, I still have my, my wife will be like, oh, this room's still cold. And so and now I'm like, all right, that's next. That's a, <laughs> so, so you set the bar so high, Brian, now that she's going to start challenging later on other parts of the house. And then you're going to start questioning all, which is what you should be doing. And I wish our government would be doing that as well too. You know what I mean? That's instead of just, okay, what's the trendy word now that the government or politicians want to use? Let's put it into the OBC. So all of a sudden we start making sure that builders will use this and do this. I'm like, yes and no. I mean, whenever there's some sort of monetary attachment to something that you want to implement into the code, I raise up the back of my hair. You know, like it's just like, I go, wait a minute. Like I was a huge against the heat recovery system for that was put into the OBC because a certain politician's brother was producing this product. And I'm like, well, there's a conflict of interest at this point, right? And it actually, the data doesn't work. It's not, a, it doesn't make any sense. So they eventually got rid of it. So it's like, you got to watch, you got to do your homework. That's the problem. And the thing is, it's hard for clients to do the homework because it's not pretty. It's easy for tradespeople who care about the industry to do the homework because it makes sense to them and they can use it as a selling feature, right? Yeah, that's really it. And I think there's been a pretty good track record of, of builders, even the Energy Star program of, of builders who, who understand, okay, I'm going to sell it, I'm a little different and, and, and sell something that is a, a better product and, and then put the work and to your point, you know, capture that because homeowners, you can't expect them to understand everything that we're going to put them through. And, you know, that the, the classic is like, we can't even get them to change our HVAC filters, let alone think about. So, so. We haven't even gone down that <laughs> road, HRV cleaning, like making, yeah, you know, <sighs> it's, it's hard. It, it, that, that education piece is no one's going to really take it on. Um, so I think uh, to, to your point on that, I think clients should actually just stay in touch with the mechanical company that they work with because they now provide those services. There's some value to that. And, and we think about the rest of the life that we live. We, we have lots of services that we just rely on experts to take care of for us. And instead of us having to understand fully, you know, I, I don't fix my own car. I, I send it to a mechanic. Why? Yeah. Like, so, you know, we, I order Uber Eats. I don't necessarily. So all the say, I think we, we're mostly in a service economy. So why not spend that time? It to should have be someone, applicable to trades. Why not? Because they know what to do or what, and they'll find out if there's any faults or whatever, and they can make you aware of it. It's it's like it's even more important than your vehicle if you think about it. Yeah, we, we send our cars in for annual inspections. We, we if your car breaks down, you can always get an Uber or get a cab. But if your house breaks down, yeah, that that emergency call in the <laughs> middle of the winter is not fun uh, for an HVAC call. So I want to do a little bit of history and construction here. So sorry, Angelie, just tell me where are we on time? We have a little timer here, and I totally forgot about it. Okay. All right. Cool. Cool. All right. So we got plenty of time. Now I'm, I want to get back on track. Sorry about that. I want to ask you, uh, Brian, uh, what's the most airtight structure in Canada? <laughs> I didn't know this. I had to look it up, but I was actually surprised. Uh, like in terms of like an air change per hour. Number? Yeah. Yeah. So this I, is, I'm going to say 0. 0. 0.007. Uh, you know, what's funny enough is that they didn't give me, did they give me the number? Or are you talking about a specific, a specific building? Yeah, so this specific building. So the industrial building in Prince George, BC holds the record for the most airtight structure in Canada. So the Wood Innovation Research Lab in Prince George uh, appears to be nothing more than a modern cedar and black metal building, but looks past the cladding and you'll, f but look past the cladding and you'll find an engineering feat that has earned its recognition as the most airtight industrial building on the continent. Uh, so the initial investment is higher 
as you've just been saying, but actual monthly costs of the ownership are lower. And that's always the goal. It has to be cost efficient. Otherwise, nobody would do it. It will cost $1,000 a year to heat is what he says. A normal building of this type would cost, take a guess on how much it would cost. How, how big is it? How big is it? Um, I'm trying to remember how, um, I don't have that number. It's a, it's a big structure. It is a big structure. So let's say uh, 10 grand. 16,000. So the same structure, if it wasn't cared for at the beginning and paid attention to, you're going from one thousand to sixteen thousand dollars. Yeah, on, on commercial buildings, it, it's crazy. Yeah. Like that's monstrous, right? So that I mean, uh, Dr. Tom Mersick, uh, assistant professor of sustainable energy at University of Alaska, and his wife, they built a five hundred and ninety square foot two bedroom one bath net zero ready home in Alaska. The air changes per hour for this home based on the third party verified blower door test came in at 0.05. 0.05. Yeah. That's that's like really good. That's net zero at that point, right? Yeah, that, yeah, that's kind of like at the passive level. And once you get down to that number, it's like you can get lower. It, it's really marginally. There's not really moving the needle. So that that awesome score. So he, the doctor, the homeowner, he was actually saying that this is saving them $4,500 per year in energy bills. Yeah. The, the colder it is, the bigger, the more important it is. If you're living in Saskatoon, you should have a, a even more airtight building. Than like this is where it's like, that's the red knobs on your stove. That's, you know, your, your heated elements. This is your heated floors. This is all the glorious, you know, the built-ins and all this stuff. That's what, that's how I look at it. $4,500 savings on a 590 square foot home. That's huge. It's crazy. So if you, you know, there's different numbers, but uh, you know, in general, the, the number the natural resource Canada would use is our homes across Canada. If you looked at the, all of their energy consumption and put it on a pie chart, the biggest slice of it is air leakage. About 40% of your heating bill wow. is unintentional air leakage. So, yeah, that of the, the bite that we can take to, to improve energy efficiency, it all starts and ends with air tightness. Okay, we're talking to Brian Cook from Aero Barrier Canada, Inc. Reducing unintentional air leakage in new and existing homes is the biggest opportunity the construction industry has to improve the energy efficiency and comfort of our current and future buildings. Aero Barrier is an automated air sealing system that provides verifiable results across all build types and guarantees that homes will be more comfortable, durable, and energy efficient through improved air tightness. Reach out via our website, airsealingpros.ca, to kick off a discussion regarding your project. All right, so Brian, let's let's get into the nitty-gritty of what you guys do, because I, I, I know there's science behind it, there's data behind it, and not a lot of people are familiar with the process. Everyone, I would say for the most part, everyone is in the industry kind of familiar with the blower door test, right? Yep. Uh, I love that they're red and the, because everyone knows what's going on, right? Uh, but I mean, you want to walk us through exactly what you guys come in and how you guys do it and what you guys take care of? Sure. Yeah. So yeah. And that let's use that base knowledge of that blower door test. And we've been doing that, you know, in the industry for you know, 34 years on maybe about 15 to 20% of our homes on a voluntary basis. Most people have seen it, maybe heard of it. Uh, and we're probably heading towards a world where we have to start testing every house moving forward. And so it's that same, that way that equipment works is it's a fan, measures pressure inside and outside. You can either do it, depressurize the house or pressurize. Normally they're doing a depressurization test. Really what our technology is and what we're doing is really just taking the next evolution of that testing equipment and, and that process. We use the exact same, you know, there's two main brands, RetroTech and Minneapolis Door. We're, we're using the RetroTech Door and really taking it to the next level and we're going to mist in a sealant at the same time as, as taking that test. So we're going to pressurize the house uh, with our blower door and set up uh, stands, kind of emitters in some of the larger rooms of the building and almost fog the space with this sealant. And under the pressurization of that blower door, you can imagine the air is trying to escape and it's going to carry our sealant to any, wherever there are any unintentional leakage areas. So kind of, I'll take a quick step back. Step one for us is we'll show up normal kind of contracting crew, two guys, three guys. At uh, what state? Okay, so you guys offer construction pre- after drywall or like new retros or like what a number of stages, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Basically we can come at different stages depending on the build type and, and there's some pros and cons to that. But let's say most of the work we're doing at the drywall stage after drywalls up, we'll come in and we're going to tape off intentional things. Some of the things you were talking about, there's, there are things that we you know naturally need to be to the outside HVAC equipment, bathroom fans, uh, range hood. We're going to tape those off operable windows, anything that we know there's, an opening there, but on purpose, we're going to take that kind of out of the equation, set up our blower door, set up the emitters on the on in, on each floor, 
and mist in our sealant. So that house is almost like a balloon. The air is trying to escape. It's going to carry our sealant as it's trying to find leakage areas in behind the drywall. Actually, as it's tr the particles make their way to that leakage area, they accelerate, start to gather, and seek out, find, and seal. So instead of this just testing where the air leakage is, we're using it, going one step further, using that air leakage to send sealant to exactly where it's leaking, and it's going to seal anything up to half an inch. So, in, it, And we're going to get live feedback on our blower door test as we're watching. So we'll show up at the site, be like, hey, man, your site, you know, this one's at one, air changes, we'll turn on the machine, let it run, and we'll watch it tick away, and we'll see it, oh, it's 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7. All right, wh which one do we want to get this so to? you're literally finding the hole, and then you're adjusting the air changes per hour? So it, it, it's sealing it, and we're getting, because it's a blower door, we're getting, we're watching it reduce. Like, it's automated. Uh, so, like, we finally have our finger on the dial of how tight do we want this house to be? We run the machine to get it to whatever that level is, and now, you know, this guesswork of it, of, that, oh, I think I built it airtight. Well, let's test and see where we're at. And, and maybe we did a good job. Maybe we didn't. Regardless of how well we started off, we'll have a good, ba we'll have a baseline number, a pretest, and it's going to find the small leakage areas for us and seal them as we go, all in about kind of like a two to three hour process. Quick question How do you seal something that the, it can't get to? So, uh, yeah, and this is where using that pressure, right? So the house, the air is trying to escape. It's like, again, 100 pascals of pressure. So it's, the air is rushing out of those leakage areas. We're exaggerating them, and it's going to take our sealant along for the ride. Oh, really? So, so yeah. And it's suspended, and it's taking the sealant around. Once it hits that leakage area, again, it accelerates, and it will start to gather along the edges. So you watch it in like a time lapse, kind of like honeycombs towards the middle, and what looks like a bead of caulking when it finds a little. And there's you know 10,000 of these little leakage areas, size of a hair strand, a shim pack between two pieces. Wow. And it, all these little ones you'd never be able to find, and it, it seals it for us. So we don't need to find them anymore. We don't have to guess where they are. The air leakage is using, we're using the air leakage itself to seal them. How long does the seal last at that point? Yeah, so it, you know, it's, we've tested it for uh, exaggerated heating and cooling seasons over 50 years, and it, it performs extremely well. It's an acrylic sealant. You know, if you looked at types of sealants, acrylics normally perform the best. It's basically like you found the leakage area and, you and you're put, caulking, you're it, caulking anyway. it. You're caulking but it. But that's, that's what we would do in the old school. That's what we still that's do what, today. We just can't find them all. Yeah. So this is really just sending a, a high performance caulking material to exactly where we weren't able to find. Yeah, we were doing about. the smoke test. We were doing thermal scans. We were doing all kinds of stuff. But at that point, we're still looking through a fog of, of, of what we visually see. You guys are finding it. Yeah, so the sealant's doing the work for us. So it's, again, this, this evolution of just testing and then guessing and working, testing and working and working. You When you talked about your house that you got to 0.7, yeah. you probably spent weeks doing that. Like, and of there hour, was a lot of extra work. And stress, and you still go, oh, I hope we did good. And everyone, <laughs> if you did good, everyone high fives. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, sometimes you, you don't get there, and, and now you have a frustrated customer, or you come up short. You told us we were going to get to 0.0. <laughs> So, so th oh. and that that sentiment right there is why it's not in the building code because no one wants to get to the end and have a test that they fail. How like do that, we put it into the building code, Brian? It well, I'll say it's it's in 22 U.S. states already. So and ones that you would be surprised. Texas has mandatory blower door testing on every house being built. Why? Because, Good for them. Yeah, and it's like a, a you know a thoroughbred red state, Michigan. So it's coming. It's the you know. Of that pie. But nobody mean, across Canada, no province. British Columbia has mandatory blower door testing. Uh, <laughs> they're a little no, different. No, <laughs> they're, they're a little more, oh, they're a lot more conscious about building a certain way because I guess they have the seismic and they've got the extreme wet moisture weather. So that maybe that's why they started. And plus, I don't know, uh, <laughs> more wealthier homes out there as well too. So so yeah, one province has it. Uh, and then I'll say like it's, it, it's, it's pertinent conversation. This is what we sit down with a lot of builders. So, I, we're Harma's, as of this year, we're moving towards a harmonized building code. So there's no going to be no longer OBC as of 2024. It's going to be a, all provinces are forced to adopt a national building code. Once Is that really month. happening? Yeah. So they're taking the, what, the national building code? Every, all provinces had to sign off to adopt a national building code and there's tiers to that and they've laid out those well, tiers. Well, that's actually a good thing because I've always questioned the OBC because it's in the end, like national building code. And I'm like, well, it's not in the OBC, so you can't build it that way, but it's in the national. So why can't I build it that? It's it, coming anyway. Yeah. It's never really made sense why each province had their own. So they, they're, they, by 2024, March, this time next year, uh, the province is adopting or everyone's adopting a national and each province has to, it's like a tiered system similar to what they have in British Columbia of 
from a, a performance standpoint of, and you have to like pick your each province picks their entry point into that tier and and we'll move on and once we're on that tier we're on this path towards performance building and net zero building is that is that basically the case because i mean we, we could just i'll say it because I'll, I'll get the letters or whatever but the thing is that they don't want this in the code because it means that the the site supers or the gcs or the builders the organization itself has to police everybody that's doing the work because they're not the boots on the ground doing the work. So if you have this in the code and it fails, then the company site super builder has to go back and fix something that should have been done properly that they didn't police at that time of building. Yeah. I think, but that's building though. Yeah. I think that's a really good. And this is what makes air tightness hard, right? So we know we've known for a long time. It's the biggest piece of that we can improve on. But there's no trade that specifically takes it on, right? Everyone has a piece of the scope of the work of it. The one I like to pick on is like, so the builders have kind of figured this out, do exactly what you said. They have to police 13 different trades on air tightness and make sure, hey, electrician, did you put a hole through the wall plumber? And for the most part, those trades get it. The one I put was like, do you think the Rogers and Bell guy understands why air tightness is not? <laughs> so like it's 13 different contractors that all have to do a little piece and understand. And all it takes is for one maybe new guy to come on and maybe not understand what... You know, the joke is they come in with a whole saw at the end and, and that sinks the builder to something that is really hard to remediate after. So that, that unknown, that uncertainty, that angst around being able to pass is why it's been fought against in, in terms of coming in because no one wants to test that they're going to have a chance to fail. And, and, and that's really where our, we feel like our technology, along with other systems, can help, right? We, you know, we can finally let go of some of that anxiety and know that, okay, we know this is important. We all agree on that. And now we can do it with a level of certainty and consistency and not worry about uh, missing or getting to the end and, and having to spend a whole lot of money and time and, and answer questions. We're adding some consistency and predictability uh, with air tightness and, and, and address that. And we've kind of positioned ourselves as, you know, we're an air tightness trade. You know, we've never had that before. And you still need to do all those other things well. We we'll, should have that category, though. Yeah. And that's kind of where we're kind of slotting in. And it's been a, a learning for us as we've started as like, okay, no one is taking this role on and the builder ends up shouldering it, but that's not their job. Like if you, we work on some pretty big sites with production builders and they have 65 trades or things that need to get done. And they're managing that at scale across it's Monday morning, Friday afternoon. <laughs> so taking something off their plate and letting them do their job, which is managing a million different things that are going on, not having them have to worry about passing a test at the end of the day. That's been our real value prop um, as, you know, taking on this role of as an air tightness trade. So sorry, Brian, I interrupted you on the, on the process side, because I know that you come in with the blower door, you come in with the, the main, I guess, component machine, but then you also have these other smaller machines in different areas of the house, right? That are the structure. Yeah. Basically think about it as like spray nozzles. So like tripods in, in the building, um, so they each are kind of emitting the sealant and, and they're controlled by our, our computer on how much to put in and when based on humidity. So it's really a relatively hands-off process, but in general, what we're working towards is really just fogging the house with the sealant. It should be like, when you go in, it should be a little cloudy. And under that, the, after that, the blower door is driving it to where it needs to go. So there's not a whole lot of like, it's taking all that guesswork and it's the computers doing the work to actually find these leakage areas. What's, uh, what's been one project that you guys have gone in and thought, okay, it should be a, a pretty good structure, but then you guys, when you first started, it was terrible. And then you got it to a pretty good structure. Yeah. Good question. Then a uh, lot, lots. It's like, especially, uh, is it, it hard to, is it fair to say that a typical track home is terrible? I know that, what is it? Is, is it uh, the minimum code is 2.5 air changes per hour? It assumes, yeah, it assumes you're at three. So if you build as per code, then you should get around three air changes per hour. Right. And that's the norm, right? And I just want to tell every homeowner that's possibly listening or every trace person, three sucks. Yeah. Three is terrible. That's a bad, bad number. Yeah. You should not be striving to get three. So this structure that you came in, like, where was it at and where did it end up being? <laughs> yeah, so we've, you know, we've done about 2,000 of them now since we started. And we've, we, we did one a couple of other days ago, and it was 30. So like, 30? <laughs> and so, like, those aren't small holes at that time. So, like, you can... That's you, the doors open. Yeah, the whole house is just... It, it, and it's an old low-income housing house, so that's a retrofit. But, so, but we've... In, anywhere in between. Wow. And I'd say, you know, it's really... You could, I could tell you based on... If the builder, could, I only ask the question, have they ever, do they know what a blower door test is? Have they ever done one? And do they test their homes? And if, if the answer to the yes is all three, they're, they're probably under that three number. Yep. If they go, what's a blower door test? 
<laughs> so if I'm if I'm buying a house, I normally I get a call. I'm like, ask your builder if they go, well, you don't need that. Well, then that's a good place to start because it it really historically been has been around. All right, if I test my houses, I at least will start understanding the types of problems that I'm going to have. Uh, and they're they're always the same areas. Yeah, and you hit on all of them. It's like if you have lots of cha- change in direction, change in material penetrations, and, and it's really about thinking through them ahead of time to get the big areas. Uh, and then the little ones are get where it gets complicated and time consuming because. You know, you can blow your brains out trying to find them, and that's really where our role sits. So, yeah, we've been anywhere between 30, and, and, and we come in, we come into passive houses where they are at, already at 0.6, and we help find the last little bits that are there. So uh, what's nice about our technology is, as you were talking about a little bit, the way you had done it on your home is traditionally the way we would improve air tightness. We would set up a blower door, put in a fog machine yeah. into the house, and see where the f- smoke comes out. Yeah. That is what aero barrier is. We're putting a fog in the house, and so we'll be able to use it to find large leakage areas as well. So it's it's sealing the small ones for us, but as it's coming out, we'll see it um, uh, come out and pour out of or try to seal large leakage areas, and we can address that with traditional methods of foam and caulk. So we've, we've taken homes that we showed up at 7, 8, and, and by the end, we're leaving them at, at a net zero pass loss level. Wow. Um, because we, we talk about it, you know, aero barrier is a really good tool in our toolkit, but our you know our trade name and what we 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 we're air sealing professionals, so we'll take on other tasks to help that project hit its goal. So let me bring up a, a typical scenario in Toronto. I, I, I'm assuming also Chicago, Philadelphia, and a lot of the eastern homes are similar. You've got a demising wall, you've got a semi-detached structures, right? And so you've got either most of the time it's a triple layer brick demising, old school clay brick, which is basically a sponge. It's got so many, it's an arrow bar. It's got so many holes in it. And that's always been a huge challenge of mine when you get into these older homes and, and you're trying to seal that. Now, does your, does that assist it? Yeah. I'm assuming <laughs> it does because I'm looking at the science behind it and I'm like going, this would have been a product that I would have loved to have had when I was tackling that. Yeah, absolutely. So even, so the building code even recognizes that what you're talking about, it's harder to seal multifamily and that party wall is, is why. So couple different things. So like we talked about the assumed air tightness and, and detached is three and the building code actually said, like, we know attached is harder. So it's three and a half for attached. So that already kind of like gives you credit for it that way. And, uh, and then sim- similarly, we know that like based on lots of testing we've done about 30% of average houses leak between those units. Um, so aero barrier, if there's a pressure difference between the two, uh, it will seal it. And, and that has huge value. If you, if you talk to anyone living in a stacked unit or a townhome, what their major complaint is or callback is, it's I can't stand hearing my neighbor or smelling the neighbor's cooking. That, that's air leakage. Sound, smell, it's all the same. It, energy, it's traveling through that partition. So we want to build um, compartmentalized units as much as possible, and an aero barrier helps that. And it's a big piece of our portfolio. Probably about, about half of all the work we're doing is in multifamily. Which is basically, well, with the recent changes with our current uh, government, you know, they're talking about building multifamily. If it, like you're having an option to do all this stuff. My biggest concern is what I've said in the very beginning is that people are, are just found a new way to cut more corners. <laughs> That's all it is. So you're going to basically build dwellings that are going to suck. They're going to be beyond three, three and a half is what else going to be. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's just, it's an education process at that. Like, I mean, it makes sense at that point where you just got to you got to put it in part of your toolbox. That's all it is. And it's like when you do your scope of work that this is just how I know a lot of tile guys have come in. They just automatically are using Schluter. That's all it is. Or uh, other uncoupling membranes. That's just part of their wheelhouse. They just do it. But that wasn't the case 10 years ago because they all thought that it was too expensive to do it. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I want to get into the costs associated with all this, right? So I just, first of all, let me just, okay, we're talking to Brian Cook from Aero Barrier Canada. Building code changes are coming in 2024 with steps laid towards improved energy efficiency. Aero Barrier and Aero Seal dealerships are available to help builders and contractors pass these new standards through sealing of the envelope and ductwork. Is your HVAC insulation or drywall company interested in adding new services to your portfolio to separate yourself from your competition and help your clients surpass new standards if so reach out via our website www.arrowseal.com to discuss further so cost wise what are we talking about here i know we're not talking crazy money here no and uh so i'll say that the major piece for us is uh is showing up so we, we have kind of two pieces of our building we're working with track builders or custom work and both are important so 
the same crew can knock off you know three four homes a day um with with just because we set up the machine it's doing its thing we can move to the other house and actually do it in parallel so to if there's anyone building multiple homes pricing would be a little different and and we can we can show some cost savings there um but in general think about uh kind of anywhere between like a dollar and dollar fifty a square foot or for us really showing up in around kind of normally tell people to start from a ballpark about four to five grand for an application to a house okay for an average size home yeah up to and like i'll say like it, it yeah it so square footage pricing depends kind of depends where we're traveling to what we're what our goal is for that day you know are we at seven air changes we want to get to one are we that those things all come to come into play but as a starting point you can kind of start from there and we can uh, uh, you know set a set of drawings and we'll, we'll get into what that particular project could look like i want to backtrack a tiny bit about uh, you brought up a really good point regarding the food and sound which is a precursor to knowing that there's voids in your structure right but there's also products out there that are membranes that are sold or even material that's sold to avoid s smells and and food smells and also sounds and stuff like that but I think where they slightly fail is where they end, where they start and finish. Yep. And it goes back to that mentality of you can have the best product, but if it's not installed correctly, then what's the point of that product? Sure, the center component of that wall, which is probably the minimum amount of transfer, is okay. But the perimeter around that membrane is not okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the way, you know, we measure sound transfer and performance of sound products with an STC rating. Yes. Well, STC ratings assume that that assembly is 100% airtight. Like, so when you go to, like, why STC ratings and so reality... So it's a false. It's a false reading at that point. Well, that's what you know, sound experts will tell you. Like, there's always a bit of a gap between what it's designed, assembly is designed to, and it's when they actually go to test it, it's performance. And not just air leakage. There's other, you know, sound is a whole other thing, but there's other things that move it. But air leakage is, is one of the biggest unknowns between what the performance of the wall is designed to be and what the performance of the wall actually is and and it, you know it's really easy you open your car window you hear everything outside you close your car window it's quiet like it, air leakage is um, a huge part of sound and, and and then again similarly noise transfer and even building code from multifamily all of our fire and smoke ratings are all based on the assemblies being 100 percent airtight but as soon as we put a blower to test on them they're not performing. It's, it's a very good They're point. not performing. Because they, air is going to fuel it. Yeah, that's what you're, we're trying. That's why we have fire-rated caulking is to make it tight between the units. But if you've got a hole if, somewhere. If, if we didn't miss, if we missed a spot, it's not doing its job. So there's huge implications across whole facets of, of the building code and why we're doing things. And, and because air tightness has traditionally been hard and challenging, we kind of leave it behind and just assume it's done right in, in a lot of cases. But you get homeowners coming into a house assuming that their house has been built properly. But then I guess they don't know any better because they see their m first month's bill and the, that's just, okay, it's a new structure. We just moved in. This is our new home. This is what it costs. Yeah. But it's not what it could. It could cost less. Yeah. I want to ask you, Brian, doing this and sealing the house and making it more airtight, will that make your mechanicals last longer? I already know the answer to this, but... <laughs> Yes, and it's a good question. Uh, this is like a, a an interesting rabbit hole. But so if you look at the way we plan houses, so building code says we talked about air, assumes air, three air changes. If you ask a mechanical contractor, it's part of their heat loss, heat loss calculation. Calculations, yeah. They have to put an air change number in there. And so that, because that how we size our equipment, we know it's 40% of our, yes. how we size our equipment, we yes. should have an idea. So the HVAC guy goes, I know that builder, they're not building very tight. So they, instead of putting even the assumed three, ask them, pretty much every HVAC concert puts in three and a half. So they hedge their bet and go up. And what else do we do? We plan our heat loss calculations on what is the coldest day of the year? There's one of those. And we plan for that. So we plan for the coldest day of the year. We hedge our bet from an air tightness perspective. Oh, and by the way, we only sell heating equipment in, in major increments of 15,000 BTU. So what we do is we end up putting in a massive size equipment, all based on assumptions of rounding up, rounding up, rounding up. And because of that, HVAC equipment is not built to cycle. We don't want it turning on, turning off, turning on, turning off. HVAC contractors will tell you that. Ideally, what you want it to be is set sized right uh, and running continuously at a low speed. That's how you get it to perform the best and, and last the longest. So I love that you said that because I'm going back to my quietness place when it comes to construction. Um, Try this, anybody in your home, turn your system off in, in cold weather, turn it off and see how long it takes 
for your house to get cold. That will tell you how poor or how good your tightness is. Yeah. And what I've been recently, because I've been doing some work as well, I have yet to drop past two or three degrees for a furnace being off all day long during a winter day. Yeah. That's telling me that all this extra effort that I'm putting in, whether it's a pain in the ass or it, whether it's caulking or membrane or whatever, it's doing something. So you're totally right. Like you, machines are not designed. Oh, the furnace just kicked in again and again and again. It's not. It's supposed to get the temp, hold it. The house holds that temp now. That's it. And so uh, to kind of long winded way of answering your question. So the future performance houses is you do the envelope first. You make them as energy efficient as yes. possible. Then and now the HVAC contractor can finally with confidence instead of putting in three and a half, they go, oh, you know what? House is going to be at one and a half. They can put they can plan for that. Put that in their calculation. Put in the right size equipment. So you'll see in the future we'll see smaller and smaller pieces of equipment because our buildings are performing better, uh, and and that you know that's going to save us energy. Not and there's some cost savings there as well um, for homeowners as well. But yeah. it's a cart before the horse thing because with the OBC, I go back to the OBC. Um, HVAC has to submit their heat loss calculations before the structure is even built. Right, yeah. So they have to know what they are trying to <laughs> say. This is where having some confidence, and again, we, we, we I like to have that conversation and uh, with with them as a. Hey, you know. So based on the drawings, this house should have been sized for this, but it wasn't built exactly as the drawings. So they rightfully, and I'm not, I don't want to condemn. No, no, we're they not right, faulting them. They rightfully hedge up because they don't want to be, they don't want to leave their homeowners with a size piece of equipment that's not going to be able to heat their home on the coldest day. But so then now we're consuming too much energy. Yeah. Everyone is everyone is rounding up, rounding up, rounding up because of that anxiety. And so again, other products and ours can help the industry go, all right, we we got this figured out now. Let's plan for a tighter building and and design our equipment accordingly. Um, and there's some cool wins out of that too. Like you want to talk uh, go back to this homeowner conversation of what they like and what they don't like. Energy efficiency is one, but you know what their designer might you might get them excited about is hey what if i had to put in less runs and you don't have that big ugly bulkhead through your main living room space that's very supposed to be able it's a very good point so like a, a performance home you can get into smaller duct runs less bulkheads like it, it, it's it, when you start to think about all the things that you can plan for up front there's some pretty compelling arguments that you can make and 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 get everyone on board it's, it's a long process brian the designers <laughs> they will still shoot you because you know what you you've you, you would have done or worked with them so well, come up with so many great ideas, and then they would have added a 20-foot big window in the back of the house. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> there's a good one. There's uh, that. So I do quite a bit of conversations with architects. So I try to, like, spin it to, for what, what hits them a little bit harder. So I, I hit the bulkhead conversation. But the other one is, so the building code has a requirement on glazing ratios. You're yes. only allowed to put in yes. 22% glazing. And uh, the joke is, if you ask an architect, they'll put in the big window the more and more. And there is a path to actually put in more windows and go over that 22% based on going performance path in the building code, which allows you to say, you know, you can model the house like in the art in eight hot 2000 and say, Hey, all the things I'm doing, it's going to be better than a code built house. So I'm allowed to yep. break certain rules. Yep. And so one of the, one of the pieces that we work on quite a bit is these monster custom homes where they want to break the glazing ratio. So they, what they do is they plan for air tightness and then, so the, the city windows. wall municipal, they would allow it at that point, right? Yeah. So you're as long as you can prove based on a model that this house is more energy efficient than what our baseline is going to be, it opens up trade-offs. So you're, you're automatically, re you're blower door and testing, you're bringing you in, you're doing, because the city's going to need this data. Yeah. Once you sign up to go down that path, you, you have, have to, to pass. Yeah, yeah. Now you have to pass all this stuff, yeah. right? And, and you're totally right about, and I want to just backtrack a tiny bit, is that at a certain point you get the 0 0.05 or you get 0 0.06 there's no such thing as a 0.01 or whatever. It, does, it, it doesn't matter at that point. There's yeah. not much more. You can't make the wall 15 feet thick and try to get more value out of it. There's a, a certain point that you've already tapped out. Yeah. And uh, I, I was listening to one of your other ones previously with yet a, a guy from Fomit and he was talking about, yeah. he was talking about how much insulation do we put in attics yeah. and like to that same point, like the code calls for our, uh, our 60 right now. Yeah. If you do the math on the difference between our 50 and our 60, it doesn't move any nothing. nothing. It's nothing. It's like a hundred kilowatts a year. So, and then at some point, someone's going to say, "Well, we need R seventy. And there's the real diminishing returns. Air tightness is similar. Once you kind of get under one passive house, you know, they'll say 0.6. That's fine. But really, under that, it's really just about bragging. You know, being a, the, the cool uh, stat that you talked about <laughs> earlier. Like after that, 
really, as an industry, we should just strive to we can get under one and a half, under one. We can put this to bed and, and, and move forward. But it's just funny that, okay, so next year they're adopting a whole across the board code, but it's still going to be set at 3.5, no? Yeah, but they'll start enforcing testing, which is in itself. That's a big It's going to be a wake up call. That's going to be a wake up call. And it, it, not necessarily, I'll clarify. They're going to national building code. I'm, and it, not necessarily that day, mandatory below door testing, but what it, they are outlining is these steps. So there's five steps, tier one, tier two, tier three. And basically between tier four and five is kind of net zero ready. So from a government standpoint and the country, we've said, hey, we want all homes to be net zero by 2035. And now we're like, okay, you are on step three. We have 10 years to take these steps. So very quickly, the next step after that harmonization is going to say, hey, air tightness has to be the one that we move. So, I, I, you know, within a horizon of five years, it's really fair to say that every home's going to have to have a blower door test. And then once you start testing, then you start seeing that number. Hey, this year's yeah. three. Yeah. And that's what we're seeing in British Columbia. They, they started testing. They were doing that before they were asked to do it. They were doing that. But now, like this year, and, you know, I think it would, I'll get this wrong, but like in January, they basically sent out the bullets and, hey, everyone, now you have to do tier four. And that means lower air tightness, some other things. So once you're on, once the steps have been shown, it's really easy for municipalities, provinces, and, and nationally to say, all right, everyone, let's take that step. So w- once, instead of this debating on it every time that gets everything kind of controlled. Well, I mean, I, I want, and this has been an argument all the time with clients, Like, right? I mean, on average, if you're building a new structure, on average, it's a million dollars for your construction costs, right? $4,500 for peace of mind to know that you could try to seal up as many holes as possible in that structure that you're going to be living in there, hopefully generationally. That's not a lot of mo- That's pennies in the scope of things. That's pennies attached to that $1 million construction budget. Yeah. Try to save some money elsewhere. Try to do things differently somewhere else. And then you can save that 4,500 because the thing is, honestly, the reality is the following year when you're using the house, you're going to save that and more in energy consumption. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I'll say the I'll say exact same thing in a different way. Uh, a million dollars and five and, and five thousand, one million five thousand on your mortgage payment is exactly the same. Yeah. Across 25 years. Yeah. So just spend that money, put it in your mortgage. Five thousand dollars over 25 years is, is zero versus saving one hundred and fifty dollars, two hundred dollars on your heating bill every single month. You can. like So the payback period on it is is pretty cool up front. I want to talk a little bit of building code talk here. Uh, it's funny that you're bringing this up, right? So uh, this has been good. I, I, I mean, this is the conversation that I love having, man. Um, is air pressure testing mandatory in Canada? We've already discussed this. We already know it, right? So air leakage testing is a new requirement since 2018 required for all tier two large part three buildings. Testing is not required for part nine. Part nine is residential, uh, but may be required by other standards, including Energy Star. So again, whatever package you choose. What are air barriers required to comply with? Uh, the requirement that is defined in most codes and standards is that the air barrier material must have an air per- permits. Per- permits? Yeah. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Or less than 0.02. 75 PA or 0.04 CFMs at 1.5 pounds per foot. Does that make all sense to you? This is all science shit that I don't know. (laughs) This defines the maximum allowable air leakage for a material that can be used part of the air barrier system. So this was interesting is that uh, what is the max air leakage for an air barrier? So any material that you're using, it's 0.04. That's the maximum that you're allowed, right? Um, So I just want to let everybody know, is drywall considered an air barrier? Yes, Yes. it is. Uh, Gypsum board drywall itself, suitable air barrier material. The taping of the drywall seams results in in a plane of air tightness as a field of the wall. However, several steps must be taken to use this material property uh, to create a continuous. Again, this has been the huge argument. You can have as many great products, but if it's not installed properly, can plywood be used as an air barrier? Air barriers are intended to resist the air pressure differences that act on them. Rigid materials such as gypsum board, exterior sheathing materials like plywood or OSB, and supportive flexible barriers are typically effective air barrier systems if joints and seams are sealed. That's why we're starting to see a lot of manufacturers come out with different types of plywoods and products, sheathing products, that we are now being told to seal. But you started wondering, listen, I was having this conversation 15 years ago. (laughs) talking about H clips on a roof 
H clips, all they do is hold the sheathing membrane. That's all it does. It doesn't seal it. But now everybody's trying to be the cool kids and everybody's using tape and you've got framers that have a roller hanging off their tool belt now. There's a re and that's the other thing. You can use all kinds of tapes and membranes, all this other stuff, but if you do not roll it down, pressure it down, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So there's a lot of you looking cool and then there's a lot of you need to be cool. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's it, it's interesting like the, those numbers and that's why I was kind of like smiling like literally all it all that is saying like the, for those materials is like does it stop air? And yeah, intuitively a piece of drywall is going to stop some air. Like it's it's never been about, you know, there's every material is an air barrier material. It's how do we connect them together? That's like we're continuous and that's where we see faults and it's so, so there's lots of systems out there. Every manufacturer is coming out with a system and and they'll tell you that they can get air tightness results and and yeah, you can. It, it's and then they all have the caveat as long as you install it right and 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 that's great too so and each of them but that's a huge part of it it's a huge part of them and and part of the challenge i'd say i think what you talked about earlier is um you know we don't need these full systems it's almost re unrealistic so as and each of those systems has their own specialty tape that goes along with it so now we have to not only maybe zip zip ones we have to roll with that tape we use a little differently and they're, it's complicated and and any single trade isn't going to have to be fully trained or it's unrealistic for them to be fully trained on a thousand different product types and all the details that go with them. So this should be universal. It, we should, we need to be working towards things that are uh, easy for us to add to homes that allow us to get to it. And so you can use, there's lots of great systems and a lot of them have multi purposes for them and there's, there's yeah. good things about them. So air yeah. is just one of it. So like th we, there's no product that we're for, for or against. They all really have lots of things going for them and maybe some drawbacks. But we need, from an air tightness perspective, is an understanding as a whole how to get to the levels that we need to. I know that we're in Canada here, and not much is discussed when it comes to AC and the, the warmer months. And I love that in the states, southern states, they focus more on on designing their envelope for cold because of all the AC that's being used. But whatever you're doing here in Canada for your heat is going to benefit for your AC later on. You're going to notice that you won't have to put the AC on as much. That's when you truly see that the work you're putting into the home is working because your AC is not kicking in as much because it's retaining the cold environment inside the structure instead of just leaking out. Yeah, absolutely. And so yeah, air tightness will help with that. And and then, yeah, it's like, it's, it's all about how you think of all these things together. And, and so Cooling has a lot to do with windows and, and, and you can work through a, a plan, but it all starts with, if you can get, you know, your envelope done right, then you can have control of those things. And, and those, that's where the, the performance side of the building comes together. I'm not a scientist. I never wear a lab coat. Uh, I pretended to be one time. I even got a name tag one for it one time. But the thing is, I'm assuming that if your house is more airtight, it restricts I guess, exterior dust and environments from entering your structure or transferring movement, movement in your structure. That's true, right? Yeah, absolutely. So there's been, and it's one of the common, uh, you know, grumbles you might hit or bones to pick of like, you know, there was indoor air quality concerns. People will say, well, if you build an airtight house, it, you know, not going to be able to, but that's why ventilation goes along with it. Yes. And so big enter, enter can natural resources study of they took, a big sample size of our 2000 homes, a hundred homes built and, and compared 30 years later, the indoor air quality of those versus code built homes at home the time at the time. And again, similarly, um, everything comes back as if you want to be able to control where the air is coming in and out. If you had a choice between a, p pulling your fresh air through an HRV controlled at a, at a low speed or at the right speed or having your fresh air come through your foundation, what would you choose? What do you think is going to have a, a cleaner air or better for your family to, to be breathing? And, and the answer is, you know, control where that air is coming in and then ventilate accordingly. So yeah, it's been, it's been debated for a long time and all the research comes back that an airtight performance built home will have an improved indoor air quality, less dust, less noise. Uh, again, you'll notice it when you wake up in the morning, it's like yeah. the way you wake up in the morning and how you're breathing, it tells you how your house is reacting. Yeah. It, it's, uh, my my father has built uh, a net. We have a net zero cottage, and one of the things he's most proud of is uh, people come over and they'll stay the weekend, and they're like, "That's the best sleep I've ever gotten." And he he loves trumpeting that is like, <laughs> but there's 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 uh, there's pieces behind it of like that indoor air quality, that quiet uh, of of a well insulated airtight home is pretty cool. At the beginning of the show, you brought up something that we actually didn't even dive into was the actual if you don't 
seal a house properly, you actually can destroy the house slowly because you can create mold, you can create problems for structure. Most homes in Canada, most homes across the board are timber framed. Timber is still, uh, you know, water, moisture, all kinds of stuff can get to it. So this is a big thing, but that, uh, again, clients don't see it. They don't smell it, right? I mean, I've had so many clients ask me, well, I think we have mold, it's black. And I was like, is it hairy yet? If it's hairy, then we got a major problem, right? But the thing is, it's attacking and you can see it. We've seen decks not be built properly. And that's, you know, wood is designed to get wet, but it's also designed to get dry. And that's how your house is designed as well, too. So if you're allowing air to get in through, and that's the reason why you start remodeling, you start renovating a certain house, and you open up drywall. Before you even open up drywall, you start seeing those black streak lines at wherever there's a stud. There's a reason why there's black lines there. There's a reason why you see the pops as well. You're like, there's air movement. Then you open up the drywall, and all that fiberglass insulation is black. And you're like, is that mold? No, it's not mold. That's just dust. That's air leakage. That's movement. That's bad. Yeah, absolutely. So going back to, you know, our building code moment there where we're talking about, you know, 925 or whatever, when the materials, it's in the code. Building Air tightness and air barriers are in the code, not from an energy efficiency standpoint. They're in there from a moisture perspective. We, as we started insulating homes, as you change the dynamic of that wall, you have to stop moisture from getting into it. And, yeah. and air leakage is, you know, we're breathing. You got your cat. You know, the dog, everyone's putting more moist air in. If they have air leakage in the winter, it travels through that wall. It hits the outside, the cold side, condenses and, and provides an area for potential mold growth. And, you know, unfortunately, some of the calls we get early on are these gorgeous custom homes. And, and not you, you said slowly. Uh, we've seen, like, major close to tear down, got big time problems just from air leakage alone. On new construction? On new construction within the first five years on because of just air leakage, not major other moisture, water intrusion problems. Like you can cause major challenges, uh, particularly, so the, 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 ma- the, the piece of it is the more you insulate, the more airtight you have to be. So where do we put the most insulation? Our attics. Yeah. If you have a lot of air leakage into your attic where you have R50 and R60, but big holes, and you go through a cold season, that's when you get things like attic rain and, and big time potential problems. Are we going to get crazy here? Brian, like when, when, okay, recently I know that, well, well, not recently, maybe about what, six or seven years ago, could have been about 10 years ago that they changed deck laws or bylaws regarding the code where at, we were allowed to use lag bolts at first to just secure the ledger board right to a, a brick veneer or some sort of um, exterior cladding. But now the code changed it that it has to be a through and through bolt. So it has to be on the other side of the ledger board on the structural side of the structure. But now you're creating a protrusion, right? So are we going to get crazy where there's going to be sealants and there's going to be like some sort of gaskets that are going to have to be attached to every single nut, bolt, thread, whatever? Like, I mean, because yeah. that's creating a hole right there. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, m- my guess is there's uh, so many different ways to build and reasons to build different ways. That's why the industry is, is so cool and exciting and there's lots of products out there for it. My guess is that it's going to go instead of the route of, that's kind of how it's written today. It's continuous. Yeah. I, it's going to go to, hey, you have to hit it under one and a half. And once we get to a certain point where we know that we're at a certain score, there's enough research to be done that, hey, we've gotten all the big holes. Now we're not worried as much about that moisture problem I was just talking about. So I doubt there's going to be, I, mean, I don't know, I'm certainly not connected enough to know, but I doubt it's going to be individual uh, rules. It's just going to be, we're going we're gonna to be in a world where there's, hey, here's the air tightness target that every house has to pass. And, and once we get to that number, we can feel pretty good that as a whole, we did a good enough job. But I wonder if the industry is actually considering this air tightness argument when they're changing certain things because they could actually be creating a worse air tightness argument. Yeah. At that point. Y- yeah. It, and then we're as, it, and the unfortunate thing is boots on the ground. We're the guys and girls that have to figure out how to make it comply with what they're asking for. Yeah. And it, it's, it's the hard part is it's, you know, again, going back to your point of like one whole system, very few houses are built one way because we have, er, er, that's the cool part about construction. Every house is its own problem that needs yeah. to be solved. Everything is custom. Yeah. And so we, we're using different materials and the the connection between pieces, points between those materials is what makes or breaks air tightness. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge. It, it, and uh, that's that frustration. That's why it's not in the code today more than anything uh, is because it's hard. I, I wish that the industry, well, the, the I guess the government side of the industry would actually take it upon how the the good 
tradespeople and builders that care about the industry take it upon each project. They take on each project as if it's a custom. We start from scratch. This is the slate. This is the drawing. This is how we build. We have our experience behind us. We know how to do it, but we should still be tackling as if this is the very first time we're doing this. So we have to ask all the questions and the questions have to be answered and we have to build that way. But yeah. that's not the, that's not the norm. No, that's, and, and it, it kind of irks me sometimes too, where I'll be talking to architects and they'll go, Oh, we can't find good builders. And then, you know, the builders, are, the builders <laughs> will say, Oh, the architects don't understand what on site construction is. And, and, and the reality is the architects maybe don't understand the realities of on site. And there's this, and then there's a frustration between what we designed versus what we, we achieved. And it's just a lack of communication. To your well, the architect should have boots on the ground experience and we should also be aware of, well, I mean, uh, trades people are asked in general to understand drawings. I mean, to, to, to build, we have to have their site. We have, we're, we're reading their table of contents. Yeah. That's how we're building it. Yeah. And so that, that, that disconnect between the two, it, it, it that's the part that's hard. Like, it, and I think again, our product helps, but there's, and there's others out there that it should be, you know, we, we challenge the architects to be have a really good understanding and, and be able to answer those questions and then spend some time on site being able to walk through the trades and then hopefully the trades understand their part to play in, 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 in what, whatever that small role is um, that they're contributing to what that house was designed to be. I got an interesting question for you because I am a fan and I haven't built one yet. Is prefab better or worse? Uh, they're prefab from an air tightness perspective. They normally perform really well. Okay. Um, you know, it's, you know, go back to that joints, it's a, it's really the connection points, right? So if you're only connecting four big pieces, you have less p- chances. But are you seeing a dramatic fail at the, because that's where I've always had an argument about, sure, prefab is a great idea. We put it in, we bring in a whole wall or we bring in a whole roof, but it's the connecting point. How does that get connected that it's tight? Is it tight? Yeah, we've, we've, we've worked on prefab homes that okay. were, weren't as great either. So it's not like it, they're always better, but in general, I'd say our limited experience that it's it's they're, they're better than trying to build a house from scratch um, just because you're you have less chances to go wrong um, but they certainly can we were working on a project right now where it was wall panels and and, and they weren't put together quite right or as soon as you complicate it all it's like if you want to and this is where the even the challenge between architects and, and reality is if you want to build an airtight house passive house is all built upon this build a box like I said, right? who wants boxes? I've, I've had this. I know, I <laughs> yeah. know, I know. So I know. no one wants boxes. Every time we change direction, add a intricate detail you were talking about earlier, yeah. your overhang, so, like that's when we get in. So when prefab starts to try to get into that world, that's when we see even more problems, right? So there's a, there's a role for prefab. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's ever going to be the end all be all because that's just not how there's so many logistical challenges. I was going to ask you and you brought it up even right now just to say it. Um, what is your ideal home for perfect air tightness? It's just a box, right? Yes and no. Like you can get any house too. We've, we've worked on some really cool net zero, beautiful mansions. Like there's a couple builders we work with and they're building like, like the nicest homes that you can see. And, and they're, they're net zero and with all sorts of, but takes them a little more work. If you wanted to make it as easy as possible, start with a box. Um, but is it fair to say that people who have deep pockets are very conscious about making their house very tight or <laughs> they don't care about that at all? Uh, a little bit. Like if you have a, like it, uh, you made a point earlier, if you're building a million dollars, what's, what's a little bit more money into that as a grand scheme. So yeah, it, there should, the budgetary pieces to it, but I'll, this is where I think sometimes track rec builders get a bad rep, but we have major production builders building net zero ready homes a, across the province. So there'll be about a thousand of them built here in Markham, Kitchener, uh, and, and moving, and we're seeing that expedite. So, so it's growing. It's it's, it's growing, and, and there, are, you know, lots of there's a long track history. I think about for the last 15 years, about 15 to 20 percent of the houses built production houses were Energy Star, so already st- a step ahead. So there's there are builders who take that on and say, hey, you know what, I can sell that. I'm building a better product than the guys across the street, and and that makes sense for my business. So we we have a, a lot of our client base is actually in that space where we're working with some of the biggest builders who are say hey we can take net zero on um, and because we can we can sell it we can do it easily and we can do it at scale so i want to ask you i know that there's a lot of conscious air tightness going on in commercial medical structures why isn't why aren't those lessons being just mandatorily just like 
apply to residential. Uh, we get it. So you go into a commercial structure, whether you work in there, you work in there for eight hours, or you go visit a commercial structure, and they want all these specific, very strict sometimes, the way how airtight is supposed to be. But then they don't care about your living quarters where you spend half of your day in and, and weekends and holidays and all this other stuff. We don't have those same rules. Yeah, it's a good question. I, and I'd probably not... Uh my, my understanding, maybe the commercial world is maybe a little bit more engineer driven yeah. and maybe that's where it comes from and, and why it seems to lead a little bit on even some from a performance building material. Sometimes you'll see some of the highest end stuff start in commercial and but I'm not really sure why it hasn't trickled down to residential. I guess that. it's just for the public sector. They, they look at it. So it's like, OK, engineering, safety. Uh, accessibility, air tightness. Uh, yeah, maybe they see it as that longer term asset, right? Where they're they're building it for themselves for fifty years, and they That's might a good point. That's may, a very may, good point. maybe yeah. they kind of see that value prop more than you know us buying production homes, knowing that I'm going to flip it in a year or two. Or I think that whole flipping production home argument is it 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 kind of got trampled on the last two years. I think a lot of people are looking at their property as a much more valuable asset now uh, than ever. Yeah. Yeah, I think builders were as much as I think they were getting frustrated with it too. They they didn't like you know, you know I've talked to enough of them. They're like, yeah, I had I would wade through the 500 applications and try to find the family that was actually living going to live there because that's what they like that that sense of pride within the industry I, is one of the cool parts I connect with. And the builders who were like, I, I want people who are living in this house. I don't want it to be some asset that's getting flipped around for. I hate Chunk saying that. Yeah, I mean, one of my first questions when I went, whenever I'm meeting a new client is the for sale sign going up. Yeah. Are you guys going to stay here for at least 10, 20 years? Because that's going to dictate whether or not I want to work with you and how much effort I'm going to bring to the table. Because obviously I'm going to be conscious of bringing certain things to the table because I'm, I've done my work. I've done my research. I, 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 I'm aware of what's possible out there. Yeah. So you might as well take this knowledge and, and use it for, for your family to benefit as a result, right? You start uh, you start pulling the strings about the children and the pets and you go, listen, do you want fewer nosebleeds? Do you want to have a healthier environment? Do you want to be like really, really comfortable and not worry about temperature differences between floors, rooms, whatever? Then let's start building this way. Start paying attention to that. But it's still an uphill battle because it's not pretty. It's not the designer stuff. It's not the Pinterest house. It's not that <laughs> kind of crap yeah. stuff. I, I want to bring up a, an argument with you about discussing. Uh, I know that the government's always, everyone. everyone's trying to be green. And governments will come along, municipal or national or federal or whatever, and they'll talk about, well, let's do this Energy Star rebate. Let's do windows. Let's do a top up on installation, all this other shit. And I've always had this argument about how that shouldn't be the case. What should be is like if you've got a street and you've got a series of homes on this street, a homeowner should be allowed to do whatever they want to their house that's going to benefit their energy consumption. So if I come in and I bring you guys in, you guys come in and you guys do what you're going to do and you, you find all these holes and you fix it. Now you obviously have dramatically decreased my energy consumption. That benefit should be presented to the government and then there should be, a, I don't know, a tax credit or a tax write-off as a result of it. You have the most energy efficient home on your street. You're competing against other people on your street and not just being a property. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I would love to try to get that into the government's hands to say, listen, let the homeowner decide on what they want to do and they can fix whatever they want. But if it brings the energy consumption down, they should benefit as a result of doing that. Yeah, you bring up some good points, and like there's the greener at home program right now, and which is by the way garbage. It's garbage. Yeah, that's what I was going <laughs> like. Well, it's it's just frustrating. Like I literally, I get because our website is Air Sealing Professionals. I get I'm not <laughs> I probably missed two calls while we've been on. Like someone yeah. says, hey, can you come? And it's like, no, that's not really. It's it's well, it's poorly communicated. It has political implications it starts out as a big number thank you for saying all that because it's true and, and sometimes it's certain manufacturers or, or certain products and the problem is they're trying like these programs end up trying to satisfy everyone i think that's the hard part with politics because you can never get to that point no so when they gets to the end end result of it these dollars never get used properly the right way and and like the joke is like you'll see these programs come and thousands of companies will pop up and they're all of a sudden they're green this green that energy expert like, this and they and that. they all fall apart as soon as the program goes away it's like that's not you know, i'm a big believer it's like build your if you can't build your business without a program it's never like that you're not in the space for the right place so 
We've seen that come and go with solar. We've seen that come and go with these different programs. It, you need to find a financially viable business model. And then if there's a program that helps get you going or helps grow it a little faster, that's that's what the government should try to help is how do we speed up the things that are working already instead of trying to come down and, and, and lay groundwork that's going to fix things that just never going to play it's out. Always an, I, I think it was a few years ago there was a program and it was just a nightmare just trying to get the rebates to begin with because all of a sudden everyone just started thinking about all this stuff and I was like, this is not the way it should be done. No, yeah, it's... it's it's, it's And mm. like, you end up getting fraud. Like, that's what you end up doing. Yeah, it's like, all crap at that point. Yeah, it, so it, it, the, in general, the programs kind of come and go and the businesses that figure out, okay, how to how to do these things for the right reasons and, you know, you know, find a market. There are people that want to buy greener things and, and save energy or we can show them the math over a longer term. But let the homeowner do their own R&D to find out what they want to use and then let them put it into their home, get the work done, yep. and then let them prove because they have a baseline. If they've been living there for a minimum of a year, they have a baseline seasonally be speaking, right? So they'll know exactly their consumption based on this winter. We don't have dramatically different winters or seasons here in Canada. So you can compare what you've done to the house now to what wasn't done before. And you can say, listen, I dropped my gas consumption by $100 per month. That's got to be a direct result from this. Yeah. So... Uh yeah, it's hard to execute. I agree, but like it's something a little bit more performing. We'll see, and you see that, you know, with energy modeling, you can kind of get into, you know, yeah. okay, how here's the changes I made, and I, and and the greener energy grant program is sort of written that way, but then it like caps each thing, so it's like it, takes, it shouldn't be a cap. It shouldn't be capped. Like you make, yeah, to your point, if I, yeah. if I can reduce it ten percent, give me the thousand bucks, and, and let me go at that whatever guess, way I want. What do you think, Brian's gonna like all these homeowners? You know what they're gonna be? It's gonna be a challenge. It's going to be a street challenge challenging all the homeowners to make better homes for themselves. That's what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I, I've read an article recently, I think, and I guess there's a neighborhood in Toronto that's kind of tr trying to tackle something similar. And it's really? kind of neat. Yeah. yeah. I have to find it after. But uh, yeah, the, similarly, like they're, they're, they're comparing their notes and bills and then taking, because, you know, you think about how these homes were built you know, on a street. It was the same problem across all of them. It was some mistake or something they hadn't thought of and they yep. made the same yep fundamental challenge over you know the 10 homes so if one homeowner figures out that code of okay this is the change i need to make and we can apply that quickly uh, i think that's how you can make an impact in, in a bigger way. are you getting the younger home owners contacting you and at least having a conversation with you about this yeah homeowners are, again our, our business kind of split is more have, for the builders yeah yeah but we on the on homeowners on the younger side or or just people are they're building their forever home. Like a lot of times people who are getting to the point where they actually have the cash to buy, uh, uh, to build a house by themselves, they probably are, are researching it and, and get a feel for it, be able to do some things. So that's a nice marketplace. We spend most of our time trying to talk to builders and, and sell to them of saying, hey, Aero Barrier can help separate your business from, you know, the other builders in, in the area. And so you can, you know, sell on, hey, I'm similar price, but oh, by the way, I can, you know, I care about air tightness and I care about... Um, you know, green building and comfort and that sort of thing. So we sp we spend most of our time trying to and the builders that we resonate well. I think you're talking about uh, seems to be that net kind of younger generation or even just anyone who gets away from the thought process of it's always been done this way as a sentiment. I love that statement. Yeah, it's it's the only we're the only industry that like likes to talk about that. It's like we're you know it's not I always know, been I, done that I, way. I know yeah. it hasn't <laughs> always been done. And then then that 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 construction it doesn't have to continue being that way. Yeah. So anyone builders that kind of have that natural like you know probably listen to this podcast because they're curious about what else is going on. Yeah. That's been a good fit for us. Okay, we're talking to Brian Cook from Aero Barrier Canada. Do you have a client or a project that has energy efficiency targets or is prioritizing the house's performance or comfort? Air tightness testing can be intimidating as no one wants to experience a failure or come up short. Look to add Air Barrier to your project to both get a benchmark test of where you are and a seal to reach any level of performance. Reach out to them at airsealingpros.ca. Uh, green book talk legal options okay this is actually an interesting one uh, we just do normally do a green book talk and sometimes it's fine but uh, I want everybody to know your legal options when the MOL Ministry of Labor has given you a ticket summons and or order uh, for those unfortunate individuals that have received them uh, these are the options that you have pay the fine that's number one. Complying with the MOL inspector's order. Appealing the MOL's inspector order. Negotiating with the Crown in response to a court summons. Defending the summons in provincial court. So 
I think most people in the construction industry are just going to pay the fine. Key takeaways for employers uh, while acknowledging that the spot audit or blitz inspection by the MOL agent can cause a lot of stress among employers and workers. It is important that all effective individuals cooperate with the MOL, which I have always said. They're just human beings. They're there to watch out for our safety. At no point in time should any employer or employee obstruct, impede, or non-cooperative with the inspector, be non-cooperative with the inspector or the representatives of the MOL. Doing so could result in an employer and or his employees being charged. I've always said this over and over in the show, just they're regular people. They're watching out for, I mean, I've had inspectors on my job sites before and I've been lucky enough to be told, listen, you got to do this and got to do this. And I wasn't given an order or a ticket or whatever. They were nice about it as long as I was complying, which I did and I complied and that was it. So I just want to let everybody know about that one. We're getting close to the end here, Brian. Uh, what don't we know? What other little details do we not know? Because other than that, basically I'm saying that as a builder, as a homeowner, you should be doing this. This should be part of your 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 business. Yeah, so I'd be, give us a call. We're happy to, to talk about your project and if it makes sense. And I think one of the things we maybe I didn't do a good enough in term. You asked about the question of when to install it. Most of the work we're is we're in after drywall, but there's some chain, chances that it might make sense for us to come in early. So the earlier you have an initial conversation with us, or th thinking about air tightness, the more you can capture the full value of. HVAC design, as we talked about, or some other things, and you can actually roll that into your plan. So if you have something you're working on or are interested in learning more, give us a shout, and we can kind of work through, hey, how does that fit? You know, one of the questions we'll probably get is someone's like, can you do this on my home? We generally stay away from occupied spaces. You know, it's a pretty inv invasive uh, process. Oh, so, so you, you can't be there for... So uh, when I mean occupied, I'm like, if you're living in your house right now, and you're like, oh, I'd like to make my house more airtight, and you have your, all your stuff in it. It, we're not going to be able to apply everywhere. It's mostly new construction or deep renovation is Got the starting it. point. Because you're going to get all over. Okay. It's, so it doesn't like coat every surface, but it will settle on horizontal. So if we're in a finished space, we're doing a lot of prep work. And so that it breaks down from a business model standpoint. So, you know, if you're doing a, a deep energy retrofit or building a new house, good time to give it an addition. Those are good opportunities to work together. And if those don't fit, uh, I didn't spend any time talking about it, but we also do our sister product. The original technology is called Aero Seal. Same process, but for sealing duct work. So if you have an old house, you know, your HVAC system, you can never get it to a certain floor. That's duct leakage. It's basically a straw with a hole in it is the before we started taping joints for How a certain you, Oh, so you guys, yeah, that's what I thought it was. I, I, yeah, you guys were connected to that. I thought that. Yeah, so same company, um, and that was kind of the original iteration I've always preferred that over tape. Yeah, it's a great product, and, and if you have a, a comfort challenge in your house, so that's a really nice existing house option. We can we can talk about that as well. I got a funny story about tape where I just saw an HVAC guy one time, just, it was caked in dust. <laughs> and he just applies, you know, the four-inch wide foil tape. Yeah. It doesn't stick because it's caked in dust. and But he was still proud enough to think, hey, I did my job. Yeah. But you didn't do your job. And that's where the, the disconnect is in this whole industry when it comes to us trying to figure out how to do the, the steps properly. Yep. You should have vacuumed, wiped, dry cloth, cleaned it, then applied the tape. Yeah. Even better, seal it. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, duct leakage, it, it's like you, the equipment will never perform the way it's supposed to if you have duct leakage. Similarly, we design it to be airtight and that taping works. Oh, no, but it's just metal crimping together and it's there's still holes he has to tape it or you know mastic or you know and for that's only new to the code as of the 90s yeah. so anyhow any, if your home was built before that so your so your your bulkheads are nice and warm <laughs> basically yeah right? your basement's toasty but, but you're losing it and what is the actual percentage you're, uh, every like connecting point or joint there's a lot of air like, leakage in there yeah. you're, you're forcing air into a like a whole system but it has then you wonder why the furthest room from the furnace is the coldest room yeah so there's that, a reason so that that's aero seal it'll fix that in, in a day it's really not like when it comes to i don't want to diminish construction construction is important but the thing is it's not really rocket science at that point if there's something not working properly, there's a reason why it's not working properly. And you as a tradesperson or as a builder, you should take the time to figure it out and then solve that. Yeah. That's just my limited thinking process, right? That's how I look at it. Yeah. It, it is hard because there's so many different different disciplines. Like there's how who can be an expert across 
every single field, electrical, HVAC. Like you, you end up at the end of the day. You well, the electricians will tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> but like that's why we work in trades. Like these are all like you need nine thousand hours to be an expert in this. Who has nine thousand hours across ten trades? Is not uh, so. Nobody does. Nobody does. So well, the ones on TV think they do, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so this is where we rely on each trade to kind of have their role and understand it and, and and take that time. And and that's that's the fun part about building. Uh, but also the challenge because it just takes one one of those to fall off. Or so why did you get into it, Brian? Like uh, five years ago, why did you see this as uh well this this was going to be daunting for you, right? Y- yeah. So I I'll say like we didn't get into it a whole lot, but so my history was my my father has been in the industry for a long time, kind of a building science expert, working on energy efficiency nice. initiatives, and uh, so he has a family business that's been successful. Uh, I kind of went off and did school and, and went to business and, and didn't want to necessarily jump into the family business or anything like that. Uh, wanted to be able to make sure that I brought something to the table if I ever got down that road. And I was working in kind of a traditional like sales role for a big company. Um, and right at the time, uh, there was a slight downturn. They were offering packages to get out. And at the same time, my father saw Aero Barrier in development and, and kind of said, hey, I, I think this is pretty cool. Why don't we try to bring it to Canada? So myself and a, and a couple partners that, hey, let's let's give this a right. So we kind of came into the industry really green from uh, had never set foot on it. On By a, the way, that's not a disadvantage. It, yeah, that's such an advantage, right? Because you're gonna have fresh eyes. Came at it naive and, and showed up on site with clean boots and, and five years ago, and, and we've learned so much. And it's been I can't never look back in terms of like I, I've talked about it a couple of times, but the pride in the industry and the cool problem solving and just the people you get to meet has been so much fun and, and really enjoying it. Cool. I think we've touched upon everything. Yeah. Is there, I don't. I, I mean, I've got. A, I've had a bunch of questions because I love all this stuff, right? So, um, before I get into the twelve questions, I think I've covered everything I wanted to ask you, man. Uh, we've talked. Yeah, we talked about noise and about transfer. So it's like, it's, I think people should just try it. That's all. Those once you try it, you'll see. I say you'll feel it more. That's just the bottom line. You'll totally feel it more. So, and it's, I keep going back to, it's not a, it's not a huge cost when it's associated with the actual construction costs. It's yep. not a huge line item, right? So before we do the 12 questions, everyone, yeah, again, Brian from Aero, Seal, Aero Barrier and uh, airsealingpros.ca and it's Aero Barrier Canada on IG. You ready for the 12 questions? Let's do it. Did you get a peek at these? I, you sent them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm always, sometimes the people, I didn't see it. I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. What is your favorite construction word, Brian? Uh, shimpack. I get that. Uh, yeah. Shimpad? Shimpack. You know? Oh, shimpack. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's actually a nice word. <laughs> it is a nice word. I never thought about it that way. It is a nice word. What is your least favorite construction word? Soffit. I can't believe you can saw it. Holes, eh? Just <laughs> holes, eh? Uh, what turns you on in construction? Air tightness. It does. What turns you off in construction? <laughs> <laughs> Leaky homes, yeah. Yeah. What's your favorite curse word? We haven't been swearing. Uh, shit. Shit. What's your favorite vehicle? Uh, I was joking. My, my wife and I just had, we had twin girls. We just bought a new Sienna, and it's lovely. It's quiet. It's great. So twins. Yeah. Congrats. Thanks. Uh, a lot of work. Yeah. But fun. you got you got a van. You got a van now. You got the van. It makes it easy, man. It's perfect. Uh, what's your uh, least favorite vehicle? <laughs> the one I brought today is my Murano. It's on the last leg, so <laughs> it's, it's putting along. What's your uh, what construction sound or noise do you love? I, I, I like a nail gun. I like a nail gun. Pneumatic nail gun or a battery? Battery doesn't have it's that the same sound. pop. Yeah, like, uh, uh, no, the pops are different. Yeah, the pops are different. Uh, what construction sound or noise do you hate? <laughs> we we had like the first aero barrier rig, and uh, we b- bugged a lot of people. The compressor on our thing, like, how loud? Oh, it was so bad. And like at the end of the day, we'd shut it off, and you could just hear all like, the trades grumble, like "Thank God." So like we 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 pissed a lot of people off early days. We're better. <laughs> we have better equipment now, but air compressors, I guess. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt one day? I think as I've learned some of these things and got to work, I'd love to try to build a house. Like from, you know, ideally we do well enough one day. I can Stress. Yeah. <laughs> All I would say, anybody who wants to build a house for the very first time, try to speak to as many people that have done it before you do it. Yeah. yeah certainly you, we'll take that. that will help you a lot. A lot. What profession would you not like to do? Probably anything medical. I don't think I could handle the blood. Yeah, yeah. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at those pearly gates? 
I guess welcome, I guess. I <laughs> That's all you can expect, man. Yep. Brian, this has been a pleasure, man. Thanks so much for being on the show and sharing all this invaluable information. And, and, and people reach out to him, brian.cook, uh, C-O-O-K-E, at arrowseal.com. And also it's Arrow Barrier Canada, Inc. And it's on Instagram, Arrow Barrier Canada. And also on the website, it's airsealingpros.ca. But it also, it redirects you if you go to Arrow. I don't know, there's a bunch of... There's a way You'll to get a hold us. of you. You'll yeah. find us through the links that we put on the show here and through uh, finding them all over social and things like that. So Thank you for so much for having me. Thanks great. so much, man. I really appreciate it. I, I love valuable like information shows because it makes builders want to be better. I hope it does at least, right? So it does me. It's awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Brian. Angeline Radier, thank you so much.